Hello and welcome to today's lecture on multiplexing techniques. And you will find that this multiplexing techniques have widespread application in data communication. Here is the outline of today's lecture. First we shall discuss why multiplexing, why do you really need multiplexing. Then we shall introduce to you the basic concepts of multiplexing and as we shall see there are two basic approaches of multiplexing. First one is known as frequency division multiplexing and second one is known as time division multiplexing. One variation of this frequency division multiplexing is wavelength division multiplexing which is used in the context of optical communication. Whenever we send optical signal through, through optical fiber light signal through optical fiber, then we call it wavelength division multiplexing, although basically it is same as frequency division multiplexing. Then uh, the time division multiplexing has again two different types, the synchronous and asynchronous. We shall discuss about them in details. Then there is another technique which is known as inverse TDM, which is also used in uh, data communication today. So, we shall conclude our lecture by discussing about inverse TDM. On completion, the students will be able to explain the need for multiplexing, that is why multiplexing is needed. They will be able to distinguish between multiplexing techniques, what are the different multiplexing techniques. They will be able to explain key, fe key, key features of frequency division multiplexing and also the key features of time division multiplexing. They will be able to distinguish between the two types of time division multiplexing, one is known as synchronous, another is known as asynchronous. And finally, they will be able to explain the concept of inverse time division multiplexing. To discuss about why multiplexing, let us uh, consider the observations uh, that we uh, have in our day to day data communication. First one is that most of the data communication devices typically require modest data rate. As we shall see, normally when we send data, an individual user requires very small bandwidth. For example, whenever we send voice, we require a bandwidth of maybe up to 4 kilohertz or sometimes 3 kilohertz. Similarly, when we send data, that time also we may not require high bandwidth. On the other hand, the communication media, which are usually used today nowadays, have much higher bandwidth. For example, if we use coaxial cable or optical fiber or if we use microwave technique, then the bandwidth of the medium is quite high. So, uh, whenever uh, two users are communicating, through a uh, link, usually the full capacity of the link is not used, not utilized. So, how do you make full utilization of the uh, link capacity? And in fact, as we shall see, higher the data rate, the most cost effective is the transmission facility. That means, to make the transmission facility cost effective, we want a medium which has high data rate. High, high transmission capacity. On the other hand, the individual users have smaller capacity. Based on this observation, the multiplexing techniques have developed. Basically, uh, it can be used when the bandwidth of a medium is greater than individual signals to be transmitted through the channel. 
in such a situation that means since the individual the uh, bandwidth of the individual signals is small then a medium can be shared this is the key idea sharing by more than one channel of signals by using multiplexing that means what you are trying to do we are trying to share the bandwidth of a channel by a number of users just like you know in a city the water comes through a bigger pipe and that water gets distributed through narrower pipe to individual residences it is somewhat like that and for efficiency the channel capacity can be shared among a number of communicating stations that means this also increases the efficiency of communication of the transmission media and uh, since uh, we are concerned about the cost you will find that most common use of this uh, multiplexing will be in long haul communication using coaxial cable using microwave and using optical fiber so these are the three transmission media which have quite high bandwidth and which are used for long distance communication and there we we, sh we should make use uh, of the bandwidth in a very efficient manner and that is where we can use multiplexing let us take up a very simple example uh, even when the bandwidth is not really very high say uh, telephone line in a telephone line as you know the uh, analog telephone line has got bandwidth uh, uh, very small bandwidth and uh, out of which about 2400 hertz can be used for data now uh, even this small bandwidth can be shared uh, for data communication in two direct two direction as it is shown in this diagram the first part 600 to uh, maybe uh, 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 what, what, two, three, 1800 this is 1800 that means up to 1200 600 to 1800 then 1800 to 3000 so 6 600 to 1800 this part this part is used for data communication in one direction so maybe uh, from user a user a to b and this the other one can be used from user b to user a user a so we see that uh, even this small bandwidth can be shared by making use of uh, this multiplexing and he here the multiplexing can be made possible by using the encoding the data by using say psk phase shift king so psk increases the uh, data rate with a smaller bandwidth smaller band uh, baud rate so even with 2400 hertz uh, bandwidth the data rate can be quite high so this is a simple example this can be used for uh, bidirectional communication between two users using the same telephone line now let us look at the basic concept of multiplexing here we use a device known as multiplexer here you see we are using a device known as multiplexer this multiplexer is combining the signals coming from n channels as you can see this is channel 1 this is channel 2 and this is channel n so from n channel signals are coming and it is combined with the help of a multiplexer then the multiplexer is sending the combined or composite signal through a single medium so you have got only one medium and the signals of n, n channels are being sent through the medium and at the other end we have a opposite device known as demultiplexer this demultiplexer separates out the signals uh, of different channels by using filtering and here we get back the signal corresponding to channel 1 signal corresponding to channel 2 and so on up to channel n so by making use of two devices one is known as multiplexer which combines signal of uh, n channels into a single composite signal which can be sent through a mid single medium and at the other end a demultiplexer separates out the signals from different of the different channels and can be sent to 
different uh, stations. So, this is how uh, the multiplexing and demultiplexing can be done. Now, as I mentioned, there are two basic approaches. First one is known as frequency division multiplexing and as we shall see, frequency division multiplexing is possible because of the analog transmission that we have uh, that is possible by using modulation. As we as you have seen, the modulation performs narrow bending of the signal. As a consequence, it is possible to uh, send n, n different signals, each of them having a small fraction of the uh, bandwidth uh, through the uh, through the transmission media. So, here what you are doing, the n channels are multiplexed and you are creating a frequency division multiplex, frequency division multiplexing and here, here we are sending all the n different signals simultaneously and obviously, they should be at different, uh, different bands, so that one does not mix with other and at the other end again by using filtering, we can separate out the different channels at the other end say channel 1, channel 2 and channel n. So, this is frequency division multiplexing. Here, we, everything is being sent in parallel. The second one is time division multiplexing. Here, the approach is little different. In the previous case, all the signals were sent simultaneously, but here it is not so. As you see, the signals are coming from different channels and uh, what is being done, the uh, the, uh, the time is divided into slots and in each slot, so in slot 1 signal from channel 1 is sent and in slot 2 signal from channel 2 is sent, in channel 3 signal from channel uh, 3 is sent, in slot n signal from channel n is sent. So, here it is not really uh, all are not sent in parallel, but as you can see one uh, it is uh, the signals from different channels are sent one after the other in a sequence uh, and uh, each is sent in a particular slot of time and at the other end uh, the they can be again separated by reading data due from this slot to channel 1, the, the data from slot 2 to channel 2 uh, and so it is somewhat like a switch. It uh, first this, this switch uh, first selects this one and transmits, then it selects this one and transmits, then it selects this one and transmits. And similarly, at the other end, the, it is it is uh, it is it is it's part from the opposite operations. First, this signal is sent to channel one, then to channel two, then to channel n. In this way, it goes on. So this is your time division multiplexing. Now, uh, uh, as we shall see, the multiplexing uh, uh, will require two different uh, signaling. As as I have mentioned. Analog, analog signals are used for frequency division multiplexing and also for wavelength division multiplexing, uh, uh, although basically they are same thing, but uh, this is used in the context of uh, transmitting uh, through optical fiber. On the other hand, digital signaling uh, is used in time division multiplexing, uh, which has got two different versions. One is time division multiplexing, that is your synchronous this is essentially synchronous and the another one is uh, asynchronous time division multiplexing in which we use digital signals. So, uh, here this, this, uh, this approach the frequency division multiplexing makes use of analog, uh, analog modulation techniques and this time division multiplexing makes use of the encoding techniques that we have discussed. Let us see how the frequency division multiplexing is implemented. What is being done? The available bandwidth of a single physical medium is divided into a number of smaller independent frequency channels. So, the smaller frequency channels, the, the available bandwidth is divided into a number of smaller independent frequency channels. Look at this figure, smaller and independent frequency channel. So, they should not overlap with each other. Then using modulation, independent messages, message signals are translated into different frequency bands. As we have seen by using uh, modulation technique that can be done because, uh, because modulation allows narrow bending and by narrow bending 
they can be translated to different frequency regions, frequency bands. And all the modulated signals are then combined into a linear by using a linear summing circuit to form a composite signal uh, for transmission through a media. And obviously, you will require a number of carriers to modulate the individual message signals which are known as sub carriers. So, this is illustrated uh, with the help of as we shall we shall illustrate it with the help of example and we shall make use of different modulation techniques. Uh, we shall make use sometimes we shall make use amplitude modulation, sometimes we shall make use angle modulation which has got two uh, types as we know frequency modulation and phase modulation. Let us see how it is being done. Similarly, the uh, for for uh, for your when the signal is digital, then we have to make use of amplitude shift king or frequency shift king or phase shift king. And as we know, the amplitude shift king and frequency uh, phase shift king can are uh, can be combined to form uh, the quadrature amplitude modulation Q QAM. So these are used whenever the data is digital digital data and uh, we would like to convert into analog signal which has to be done uh, whenever we want to do frequency division multiplexing. Let us see how it is being done. So, here uh, the signals are coming from different sources, source 1, source 2 and source n and here you have got the modulator and as you can see different sub carriers f 1, f 2 and f n. So, these are the sub carriers are used to modulate different signal and if this is the bandwidth of the modulating signal and the, sig the bandwidth of the modulated signal is shown here, uh, it is around that carrier on both sides as you know if the bandwidth here is B uh, of the, uh, the signal source analog signal then bandwidth of the modulated signal as you know is 2 B and uh, after the uh, after these are combined together as you can see total bandwidth is summation of the individual bandwidth. So, f 1 uh, plus that means this 2 b plus 2 b 2 b in this way and obviously, the separation there should be some separation between f 1, f 2 and f n. So, that the, there is no overlapping. So, this is the transmitted signal uh, bandwidth as you can see the transmitted bandwidth is some total of the individual bandwidths of different signals. And at the other end that composite, composite signal is received and then demodulated. Demodulation is nothing but some kind of filtering and here individual filters are having uh, are essentially band pass filter having uh, central frequencies f 1 for this case, in this case f 2, in this case f n. So, you can see these are the filters and then, then after doing this demodulation and filtering these signals can be sent, then of course, you have to do uh, that uh, signal has to be uh, converted back into actually this filter should be here, I believe it has got interchange, filter should be here and demodul demodulator should be here, the, the figure has got interchange and uh, so demodulate after demodulation we get the uh, original uh, signal which has to be sent to the destination. So, uh, this, this will be here and this will be here. Okay. So, this is how the frequency division multiplexing is done and as I mentioned the uh, there should be some separation between different uh, frequency bands. So, this is corresponding to the channel 1 with, with sub carrier F C 1 and this is the band the this is corresponding to bandwidth of the channel 2 F C 2 and so on in this way you have got channel n with, with sub carrier frequency F C n. Now, as you can see between each band there is a small uh, small gap and this is known as guard band. This guard band is necessary so that the channels uh, do I mean to uh, channels must be, must be separated by strips of unused bandwidth that is your guard band to prevent inter channel cross talk. So, if there is no separation, there is a possibility of cross talk since they are very side, they, if, they, if you place them side by side without any separation, there will be some overlap which will lead to cross talk. So, we have to avoid cross talk, these guard bands are used and obviously, it is an extra overhead. 
So, apart from the sum total of the bandwidths, some additional bandwidth is wasted for these guard bands. This is an extra overhead that is used in frequency division multiplexing. And this frequency division multiplexing has many uses as we know. For example, the transmission of AM and FM radio signals. Every day we are listening to AM amplitude modulated that AM radio stations and FM radio stations. FM has become very, very popular because of the quality of the signal nowadays and both are based on frequency division multiplexing FDM. And our TV broadcasting is also based on uh, frequency division multiplexing because you have different uh, TV stations and they use different bands for transmission of their signals and in the TV that receiver we, we can select different uh, channels uh, by with the help of different the filtering. And also uh, we are familiar with cable television where the signal is distributed with the help of coaxial cable. Later on we shall discuss about it in more details. There also we use frequency division multiplexing. So, these are the three important areas where frequency division multiplexing is used and nowadays cable television is used not only for signaling video, cable, uh, cable modem, cable television of cable modem can be used for the transmission of data. Then as I mentioned, there is one uh, special, I mean that spe special type of multiplexing frequency division multiplexing is called wavelength division multiplexing whenever we are sending light signals through optical fiber. And this uh, why we call it wavelength division multiplexing? The reason is the frequency is very high, so wavelength is small. So, instead of stating in terms of frequencies, we state in terms of wavelengths and particularly this wavelength division multiplexing is becoming very, very popular because of the enormous bandwidth provided by optical fiber medium. And uh, to make use of the enormous bandwidth, wavelength division multiplexing is the most viable technology that overcomes the huge opto electronic bandwidth mismatch. As I have told, the optical fiber can send very high bandwidth. On the other hand, individual users who are sending either uh, audio or video, their bandwidth requirement is smaller and only by using wavelength division multiplexing, we can share an optical fiber and uh, we can make use of the huge uh, bandwidth mismatch or make use of the enormous bandwidth and it also uh, uh, overcomes the huge optoelectronic bandwidth mismatch. And wavelength division uh, multiplexing optical fiber network comprises optical wavelength switches or routers interconnected by point to point fiber links. Later on we shall discuss about it and end, end users may communicate with each other through either all optical wavelength division multiplexing channels which are known as light paths which may span over more than one fiber links. That means over a very long distance the signal can be sent in the form of light and at the other end with the help of suitable transducer as we know that uh, we can use the diodes, uh, pin diodes for conversion from light signal to electrical signal and then get back the original data. So, the basic approach as you can see is same. Here you have got a number of sources, n sources coming 1, 2 and n and uh, here is the bandwidth of the optical signal and these are multiplexed and getting the, uh, this is the bandwidth represented in terms of wavelengths. This is the bandwidth of the first signal lambda 1 to lambda 2, then lambda 3 to lambda 4 coming from source 2 in this way lambda 2n-1 uh, uh, minus 1 to lambda 2 that is coming from source n. So, these are expressed in terms of wavelengths, but essentially these are uh, f small frequency ranges and these light signals are transmitted through optical fiber. So, here you can see the bandwidth is much more which can be easily sent through optical fiber and the optical fiber with the help of demultiplexer, we can separate out different uh, optical signals having different uh, frequencies and then they can be sent to destinations. 
you may be wondering how really it can be done, this multiplexing and demultiplexing. This can be explained uh, very easily with the help of uh, this simple diagram where we have used two prisms. As you know, uh, optical signal, the light signal has two properties, ref reflection and refraction. So, we can make use of the refraction property to combine light signals coming from three different sources, then, uh, then as you can see a single composite signal is here, which can be sent through optical fiber through this region and at the other end with the help of another prism, they can be separated out and we get, we can get back all the three different signals. So, this is how the wavelength division multiplexing can be done. Now, uh, let us focus our attention to time division multiplexing. As I mentioned, time division multiplexing is used when we are using digital signals and digital signals uh, as you know uh, are generated by different encoding techniques, we shall discuss about them in details. We have already discussed about them in details. This time division multiplexing is possible when the bandwidth of the medium exceeds the data rate of the digital signals to be transmitted. And here also that means, here there is a possibility of sharing, then multiple digital signals can be carried on a single transmission path by interleaving portions of each signal in time. So, what we are doing essentially, we are interleaving signals, first we are sending signal from channel 1, then signal of cha from channel 2 then signal of channel 3, in this way we are interleaving, then we are sending it through the uh, medium having higher bandwidth. This interleaving can be done at the bit level or in the block or by blocks of bytes. That means, we can, uh, we can take one bit of from channel 1, then one bit from another channel, then one bit from another channel, we can do it this way, this is called bit level interleaving or we can take one byte from channel 1, then a, a second byte from channel 2, then third, uh, the third byte from channel 3 and so on. So, this way uh, we can do interleaving in terms of bits or in terms of blocks of bytes. And obviously, uh, uh, in this case as I told, we shall be using digital signal and digital signals are generated by using suitable encoding technique, we have already discussed about that. If the data was digital, digital signals are generated by using three different types of coding, unipolar, polar or bipolar. Similarly, if the original data was in analog form, then digital signal can be generated by using pulse code modulation or delta modulation. In, in either case, ultimately we have got digital signals. These digital signals as you know can be is expressed in terms of bit, bits per second or kilobits per second, that is the data rate. And these digital signals can be uh, sent through a medium by using time division multiplexing. However, this will require some kind of buffers, each the incoming data from each source are briefly buffered and each buffer is typically one bit or one character in length depending on the interleaving level as I mentioned. The buffers are scanned sequentially to form a composite data stream. So, uh, by sequentially scanning the different bits, a composite data stream is created and the scan operation is sufficiently rapid, so that each buffer is emptied before more data can arrive. Can arrive. So, let us see how this is being done. Say here you have got so, uh, data is coming from source 1, source 2, source n. So, as if there is a some kind of switch, you are taking from this source, then from this source, in this way you are taking and we are creating a frame. So, as you can see here, uh, in this frame, first we have got the data from source s1, then from source s2, uh, then source s minus, uh, s3 and so on up to s minus n. After taking data from n sources, again it is started from source n, n s1, as you can see here, second frame is started and then from s, source s2, then from s, s3 and so on. Then this is sent in terms of time, so this frame is sent, then this frame is sent and so on. So, as you can see here, 
there are n slots in each frame. So, this is this is slot 1, this is slot 2, in this way you have got n slots and each slot corresponds to uh, a particular source. That means, slot 1 corresponds to data from this source, uh, slot 2 corresponds to data from this source, slot n corresponds to data from this source. Uh, however, whenever we are doing the framing, it is some additional bits are necessary for synchronization. Usually per frame one bit is used for the purpose of synchronization. So, a special bit or bit pattern is added in a control uh, in a control channel. So, this is used for synchronization. For example, uh, for each frame, if this is the frame, at the beginning of each frame a 1 is added, then if it is the next frame at the beginning of e this frame a 0 is added. In this way uh, alternately 1s and 0s are added for the purpose of synchronization and these bits are used, full, used for the purpose of synchronizing a frame. Essentially this, 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 this synchronization bits states that this is the beginning of a frame and uh, the, the different slots, data from different slots has to be taken from uh, for different uh, are coming from different sources and they are demultiplex at the receiving end. However, sometimes you know the data rate from a particular source does not match or is not multiple the, ra the rate at which the uh, scanning is done while doing multiplexing. In such a case, some uh, additional bits are added which is known as pulse stuffing or bit padding both the terminologies are used to facilitate synchronization of different uh, data rates. For example, you are sampling at the rate of uh, say 8 kilobits per second. So, here data is coming at the rate of 8 kilobits per second, but suppose here it is coming from it is 8 kbps, but here it is coming at the rate of 7.2 kbps. So, obviously, uh, these two uh, cannot be synchronized. So, uh, what is done? Additional bits are stuffed into this for, uh, so that the data rate for this is for 8 kilobits per second and then at the receiving end those dummy bits are uh, taken out or separated out uh, because it is known that this, course, this the, the, the data from this source is coming at the rate of 7.2 kilobits per second and so the, those extra dummy bits can be <coughs> taken out. So, this is known as pulse stuffing or bit padding so that the signals from different data sources having different data rates can be combined by using time division multiplexing. So, this is your pulse stuffing or uh, bit padding. Uh, here is an example of synchronous time division multiplexing. So, here for example, uh, here is the transmitter data is coming from four sources say this is the source 1, this is source 2, this is source 3, this is source 4. And as you can see here source A has got four characters to be sent, uh, has four characters, source B has got three characters source C has two characters and source 4 has uh, only one character to be sent. So, as you do the framing, the first frame has got four characters coming from four different sources. So, here you have put A from coming from source A, then you have put uh, B in slot 2, this is corresponding to second frame, then uh, here you have put uh, C coming from third uh, source and D coming from fourth source. So, this is how the first frame is created. Now, as you go to the second frame, the second A is, uh, is put here in the first slot, then second B is placed in the second slot, then second C is placed in the third slot. Here as you can see there is no data, those, this slot goes empty. And when we go uh, prepare the third frame, the uh, first two slots are filled up by the third characters from source 1 and source 2 respectively. So, here in slot 1 from this uh, third character A 
and uh, in the second slot the third character B, but these two uh, slots remain empty because there is no data. And at the receiving end however, they can be received and they can be sent to different sources as you can see as it is coming this A will go here, this B will go here, this C will go here, this D will go here. So, there is no problem in, in multiplexing and demultiplexing. The problem is somewhere else. What we are observing in this particular case, the data that is coming from uh, that is I mean that is generated by framing uh, has got some redundancy. That means, if a particular source has no data to be sent, that particular slot goes empty because each slot is dedicated for a particular source. So, uh, in this case as you can see in, in, in frame 2 one slot goes empty, in frame 2 two slot goes empty and in frame 3 three slot goes empty. So, uh, this, uh, this, the, this is essentially uh, wastage of bandwidth because here it, as you can see the bandwidth of this medium is higher which is we, this composite signal is sent through a uh, medium which has higher bandwidth. So, you can the data rate here is much higher than these data rates. So, the band the, the transmission media having higher bandwidth uh, is used for sending multiplex signal. However, in synchronous time division multiplexing as we find the bandwidth is not fully utilized there is some wastage of bandwidth. So, this wastage of bandwidth we have to overcome we have to overcome this problem. This is this this is the limitation of synchronous time division multiplexing. As I have seen many of the time slots in a frame may be wasted. This problem is overcome by using a new technique which is known as statistical or asynchronous or intelligent time division multiplexing. Actually uh, there are three different names to refer to the same thing. So, it is referring to asynchronous time division multiplexing, but sometimes it is called statistical time division multiplexing or intelligent time division multiplexing. So, in, in this asynchronous time division multiplexing slots are allocated dynamically on demand. In the previous case as we have seen the slots are pre assigned dedicated to each channel, here it is not so depending on whether a particular channel has some data or not a, a slot is allocated dynamically. So, no slot is uh, uh, assigned to a particular source, any slot can be used by any source and it takes advantage of the fact that not all the attached devices may be transmitting all the time. For example, whenever we talk uh, over telephone line all the time we are not speaking, sometimes we are listening, sometimes we are thinking. So, that silence period is wasted whenever uh, we say, talk through telephone line. So, uh, the, that wastage can be overcome by using statistical time division multiplexing. Let us see how it can be done. This is illustrated with the help of this simple example. Here data is coming from four different sources A, B, C and D and here you have got the high speed multiplexer. Here obviously, the data rate is four times that of the data rate of these uh, inputs. Now, uh, uh, so here, here there are different time slot. So, this is corresponding to source going to source A this data is going to source B, this is going to source C and this is going to channel source or channel D. Now, as you can see uh, during time T0 this time during this time slot T0 to T1 only uh, uh, channel A and channel C has data. Similarly, during slot 2 channel B, channel C and channel D has data, 
during slot 3 channel B and channel D has data, during slot 4 channel A and channel C has data. So, if we use synchronous time division multiplexing, the framing will be done in this way. In frame 1, we shall have the uh, this data, this is A1 and C1. In frame 2, we shall have B1, C1 and D1. In frame 3, we shall have B2 and D2, as you can see B2 and D2. And in frame 4, we shall have A2 and C3. And we can see these are the time slots which are wasted. Although we have large bandwidth from here to here, the bandwidth is quite high, we are not making use of it. Let us see what we can do in synchronous time division multiplexing. The synchronous time division multiplexing, in synchronous time division multiplexing, we reduce the bandwidth. So, uh, instead of four uh, slots, we have only two slots coming out from this, uh, from this multiplexer. So, we have got in a frame, we have got only two data. So, uh, in the first frame, we are sending A1 and C1. In the second frame, we are sending B1 and C2. In the third frame, we are sending D1 and B2. In the fourth frame, we are sending D2 and A2. And then in the fifth frame, C3. So, we see that wastage is much less. And the remaining slots here, these frames and slots can be used for sending data uh, coming from uh, from the other time slots. So, we are making much better use of it, the uh, available bandwidth. And so, uh, in this asynchronous time division multiplexing, since the data arrived from different sources, are dis, uh, arrived from and are distributed to IO lines unpredictably, address information is required. You see, there is a problem in this. Although we are able to make use of the bandwidth in a more efficient manner or we can say in a different way with a, with a transmission medium of lesser bandwidth, we can send signals coming from different sources provided they do not generate data continuously. However, there is a problem. At the receiving end, it is necessary to identify which data is coming from where. For example, at the receiving end, uh, this slot is not meant for only data from source A1, source A or this is not meant for source B. So, data in this slot data can be sent uh, by any one of the channels or data can be taken from any one of the channels at the receiving end, how the receiver will know that data of a particular slot belongs to a particular channel. For that purpose, you have to incorporate address information. So, for proper delivery at the receiving end, it is necessary to have uh, address information embedded as part of the data. So, there, there, there is an overhead. So, apart from data as you can see here, we are adding the address information. And since it is an overhead, we want to minimize it. If you are sending say one, so one source per frame, then we can do the framing in this manner, data and address that we can send in a particular frame. Whenever we are sending multiple, uh, I mean uh, there is a frame coming from multiple sources, we can, uh, we shall also require address information and length of data. If we use variable length data coming from different sources for each of the sources. So, for each of the sources, we require address, length and data. That was not so in synchronous time division multiplexing. There the, uh, that the number of bits to be taken was fixed and the slot allocation was fixed. Here it is not so. So, this additional uh, information that is needed to be sent through the transmission media has to be minimized. And to do that, sometimes we make use of relative addressing, so that this the number of bits required required to specify the address is smaller 
whenever we use relative addressing. And uh, sometimes we can use fixed length or length also can be specified uh, in a uh, in some uh, in some special way so that the field length field is smaller, so that the efficiency of asynchronous time division multiplexing is more. <coughs> in asynchronous time division multiplexing, the data rate at the output is less than the data rate at the inputs. We have seen that the data rate at the inputs is higher than the data rates at the output. How? Because the, uh, the, the inputs are not always sending data. However, in peak periods, the input may exceed the capacity because the output bandwidth is smaller than the sum, so, sum total of the input bandwidth. In peak periods, uh, there will be some kind of overflow. It will exceed the capacity. How can we overcome this? To overcome this, we can use buffers of suitable size to store the data, then they can be sent, they can be selected at later time slots. So, some experimentation has been done by which uh, one can decide what should be the buffer size for, uh, for achieving uh, efficiency. Let us assume there are uh, n is the number of inputs r is the data rate of each of the source, m is the effective capacity of the output and alpha is the mean fraction of the time each input is transmitting. That means, the sources are not transmitting all the time. That is the important property that we are exploiting and obviously, the alpha is less than 1, it lies between 0 to 1. Then a measure of the compression, that means, the bandwidth of the transmission media compared to the maximum bandwidth that is required. That is the value of C. M is the, uh, M is the uh, effective capacity of the output and N into R is the, <coughs> is the uh, maximum bandwidth because you have got N sources and R is the data rate of each source. So, you see this factor is again less than 1 and it lies in the range alpha uh, to 1. So, C lies alpha to 1. So, depending on uh, the statistical behavior of the inputs, the value of alpha and value of C will depend. That is the reason why it is called statistical time division multiplexing. So, uh, uh, we have discussed the uh, frequency division multiplexing, we have discussed time division multiplexing. Here we have another very important uh, technique which is known as inverse multiplexing. This, this is opposite of the uh, multiplexing technique. In the previous case, what was done? The individual inputs were of lesser bandwidth, then we are combining to form a uh, composite signal of higher bandwidth. Here it is the opposite. Here we are receiving signal of higher bandwidth, then it is divided into a number of uh, channels of smaller bandwidth and at the other end the opposite operation is done. In what situ situation it can be used? Let us see an application. Suppose you have to send uh, say voice which will typically require 64 kilobits per second. Then let us assume you have to send data which will require say 128 kilobits per second and video which will require say 1.544 megabits per second. Now, the user can, uh, you can uh, borrow, can hire a medium uh, of transmission capacity 1.544 megabits per second. Then whenever it wants to send video, it will make fully, it will make full use of the transmission bandwidth. However, whenever it is sending data, that bandwidth is not utilized or whenever it is sending voice, the transmission bandwidth is also not utilized. Let us consider the other alternative. The other alternative is that here uh, you have got 
channels of a number of channels a number of channels of smaller bandwidth and these bandwidths say it is only 64 kilobits and you have get got a large number of 64 kilobits uh, per second bandwidth uh, available here and which are available on demand. So, the, the here we are making use of the property bandwidth on demand. So, whenever we are sending voice only 64 kilobits per second bandwidth is demanded and one channel is assigned. Whenever we are sending data, two channels are made available to send 2 kilobits per second and obviously, we are doing some kind of demultiplexing, dividing this data into uh, two separate channels and sending and at the other end again we are combining. Whenever we have to send video, we will require a number of channels which are demanded and the video data is divided and sent through a number of channels and at the other end they are combined to get back the data. So, here we see here uh, there is a cost more cost effective use of the bandwidth and uh, the, the facilitator is providing you bandwidth on demand and as a result uh, the as and when the bandwidth is required that is being utilized and that is why this technique is known as inverse multiplexing and nowadays this kind of facility is available. So, we have discussed various multiplexing techniques. Now, the, it is time to give you the review questions. First question is in what situation multiplexing is used? Second question is distinguish between the two basic multiplexing, te multiplexing techniques. Third question is why guard bands are used in frequency division multiplexing? Fourth question is why synchronization pulse is required in time division multiplexing? Fifth question is what limitation of time division multiplexing is, uh, is overcome in asynchronous time division multiplexing and how. Sixth question is design a time division multiplexing system having output bandwidth of 128 kilobits per second to send data from four analog sources of 2 kilohertz bandwidth and eight, eight digital signals of 7200 bandwidth. Here we see we have to do uh, pulse stuffing, pulse uh, bit, bit stuffing so that the synchronization is possible. So, the answers of these questions will be given in the next lecture. And here are the answers to the questions of lecture 10. First question was which modulation technique is used in optical communication? As we know, uh, on of keying is used in optical com com, uh, communication, it is some kind of amplitude modulation technique is a special case of amplitude modulation or uh, amplitude uh, shift keying a ASK technique. Amplitude shift keying which is known as on off keying is used in optical communication. Then what are the three modulation techniques possible in modems? We shall discuss about modems in detail later on. The three modulation techniques are amplitude shift keying, frequency shift keying and phase shift keying. We have discussed it in detail in lecture number 10. Then the third question was why phase shift keying is preferred as the modulation technique in modems. Uh, in PSK scheme, it is possible to send signal having more, uh, having more than one digital value the approach is known as quadrature PSK. That means, the with the here the baud rate is less, baud rate is less than the data rate. As a consequence, we can send more data through a transmission medium of smaller bandwidth. That is why PSK is preferred. Fourth question was, out of the three digital to analog modulation techniques, which one provides higher data rate? answer is for a given transmission bandwidth, higher data rate can be achieved in case of PSK. In other words, in PSK higher channel capacity is achieved 
although the signaling rate is lower. So, that is the end of all the questions. So, we have discussed various multiplexing techniques as I told the multiplexing techniques have widespread application in different areas. In the next two lectures, we shall discuss about the applications of multiplexing like telephone system and so on. Thank you.